Welcome to our chapter dealing with the heart. So in this chapter we're going to take a look at cardiology and we'll look at not only the anatomy of the heart but also the physiology of the heart and then after understanding some of the normal functions from the heart we'll take a look at also some of the pathologies. So when, we take, when we're thinking about the heart I know that most people think of their heart as a pump but actually the heart isn't a pump. It isn't one pump. The heart is actually two pumps. There is a right pump and if you look at my mouse I am separating the right side of the heart from the left side of the heart and if we were to do a mid sagittal section we would see that the right side is not symmetrical with the left because they are two separate pumps. The right side of the heart is actually going to be sending blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. It's not very far away. The lungs are not very far away from this right pump. So it's much smaller than the left side, the left pump. Because once blood has gone to the lungs that was sent from the right side to the lungs, it's going to pick up oxygen, drop off CO2 and pick up oxygen, and come back to this left side, the left pump, to be sent throughout the body. So this left muscle wall is much larger because that pump is having to send blood not all up to the head, through the shoulders, to the fingertips, and then down to the rest of the body, the lower part of the body, to the all the way to the tips of your toes. So two pumps, a pulmonary pump that's on the right side that blood is returned to from the body it's returned to after it's dropped off oxygen and picked up CO2 and then it's going to be pumped to the lungs which are not very far away pumped to the lungs for gas exchange and then in the left side the systemic circuit it that pump is going to send blood actually to the entire system so it's called the systemic circuit because it's sending blood to the entire system so that oxygen can be dropped off CO2 picked back up and then brought back to the right pump. So really two pumps working in perfect synchrony. What I'd like to do is jump to a sat a coronal section of the heart and if we were to take this picture of the heart and we see the chambers inside we have two upper chambers this is the where my mouse is the right atrium that's the right upper chamber and here is the left atrium we can see part of it not all of it because it's a flat picture but we understand the heart is three-dimensional so we've got these two upper chambers that are receiving blood from that heart that blood is being brought to the heart so from the right atrium it's being brought to the heart from the system and it has its oxygen poor on this right side because it has already dropped off oxygen on the left atrium this is coming from the lungs so blood is being brought to this left atrium from the lungs and it's oxygen rich so blood comes to the heart I'll make this bigger because I really want you all to see blood comes into the heart into the upper chambers called the atria they fill at the same time the right one is being filled with blood that's from the system it's now oxygen poor the left atria is filling with blood that came from the lungs it's oxygen rich and when the atria contract at the same time they send blood to the lower chambers this right lower chamber is called the right ventricle and when it contracts it's going to send blood to the lungs so the right ventricle when it contracts will push blood out to the lungs which we said is not very far away from the right pump this is the right pump so the muscle wall is not that thick the left side on the other hand the left atrium had received blood from the lungs when it contracts it sends blood to the left ventricle this left ventricle that's here and when this left ventricle ventricle contracts this muscle is much thicker on this side of the pump 
because it's going to push blood through this aorta that has to send blood up to the hair follicles, out to the fingertips, and then some of it actually goes down through the descending aorta all the way to your the tips of your toes. So please, what we need to think about is that the heart is not a pump. It is two pumps working in perfect synchrony. And they must be working in perfect synchrony because the vessels that the blood is coming into the heart from and the vessels that carry blood away from the heart, it, they're a closed system. So when you think about those vessels as being a closed system, if the right pump was not working in synchrony with the left pump, then blood would be backing up somewhere. So we're going to need to keep that in mind because we'll think about some disorders in just a little bit, but we need to keep that in mind. So again, four chambers of the heart. The two upper chambers are called atria. That's a plural for atrium. Right atrium is here. Left atrium, we can see partial of it here. Those are the upper chambers, the atria. Blood from the fills the upper chambers coming from actual from veins. Veins bring blood to the heart. Blood comes to the heart into the upper chambers. So we have the superior on the right side, we have the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava, both bringing blood to this right atrium. Veins, vena cava is Latin for veins. On this left side, we have pulmonary veins. Veins bring blood to the heart. Pulmonary veins, they're called pulmonary veins because they are coming from the lungs. And pulmonary means lungs. So we have actually the left pulmonary veins contributing. And if we could turn this heart around, we would see the right, from the right lung, this right pulmonary veins are also contributing to this left atrium. So veins bring blood to the heart, to the atria. When the atria relax and fill, receiving that blood, they then will get a signal to contract. And when they contract, blood goes to the lower chambers of the heart, which are called ventricles. This right ventricle will fill, the left ventricle will fill at the same time, and then they contract at the same time, ejecting blood away from the heart. So the ventricles eject blood away from the heart. The right ventricle ejects blood into the pulmonary arteries. Arteries carry blood away from the heart. The left ventricle ejects blood into the aorta, which is an artery, a major artery, that is going to carry blood and disperse blood throughout the body. So we're learning some anatomy here. We're learning that there are four chambers. The, right, the upper ones are called atria. The lower ones are called ventricles. We're learning that the vessels that bring blood to the, to the heart, to these atria, are called veins. The, the vessels that carry blood away from the heart when it's been ejected from the ventricles are called arteries. And so we're actually learning some anatomy as we're thinking about the, the physiology of how the heart is actually functioning. What I want you to notice on this diagram, because it's a pretty good diagram, it's an anterior aspect, the front of the heart, that there's been a coronal section made, so also called a frontal section sometimes, where you have removed the front part so that we can see all of these chambers, you'll notice that there's some structures that look a little bit interesting here. Between this right atrium and right ventricle, there's a flap. <laughs> Looks kind of like a flap, doesn't it? Flap. On the left side, there's one too. Between the left atrium and the left ventricle, a flap. What these are, are going to be um, valves. Valves. The part of the flaps have been removed, but these valves that are between the atria and the ventricles are called AV valves, between atria and ventricles. There's a right AV and there's a left AV. There's also, the right one has another name it's called by, it's called by the tricuspid. 
the word tricuspid because if we did a different um, dissection of this these valves we would see they have three little cusps there will be a picture we'll see this on in just a minute but this right AV valve is also known as the tricuspid the left AV valve is known as the bicuspid and the reason is as you could guess is that there's only two cusp not three it's also not my fault that it's named so many things but you do need to know the names this left AV is also known as the mitral valve. Some people remember this valve by the um, little mnemonic LAMB, LAM, because it's the left AV, also known as the mitral, also known as the bicuspid. So if you ever hear mitral valve or you might hear bicuspid, you know they're talking about this particular valve. That's one set of valves that the heart has between the atrium and the ventricles, but there's another set of valves that, th that are very important to heart function. And those valves are called semilunar valves. And the reason they're called semilunar is they look like half little moons, don't they? Kind of. From this dissection, they do this illustration. But the, again, the right one has a name. This is called the pulmonary valve because it's separating the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. The left, that we can only see part of right here, between the left ventricle and the aorta, again, this is three-dimensional, is why we can only see part of it right here. This is called the aortic valve because it is separating the left ventricle from the aortic artery, which is a major artery. So two sets of valves. We said that these two pumps work in perfect synchrony, or they better be for health. So as the atria fill with blood, they will then get a signal to contract. When they contract, blood goes into the ventricles, the bottom chambers. And as the bottom chambers are filling, so that blood won't backflow into the atria, these valves have to shut. So as the atria are filling with blood, they get to a certain fullness and the valves shut. And as the ventricles contract, blood will not go backwards. It will go out of the heart as it should through these arteries. The right side will be sent to the pulmonary artery. The left will be sent to the aorta. And they blood won't go backwards into the atria because the valves are doing their job. They're shutting. Now, after these ventricles contract and blood is ejected into these arteries, they start to relax. We don't want blood to backflow into the ventricles. We don't want blood backflowing. We want it going in one direction. So then these semilunar valves shut. This pulmonary semilunar valve and the aortic valve will shut. If you've ever wondered what gives makes heart sounds, when we think about a heart beating, it is it goes boom boom, boom boom, boom boom. The textbook, I guess because they can't spell boom boom, your textbook calls that Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. Everybody's listened to someone's heartbeat before, and you know that's really rhythmic. Uh, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. What's making the heart sounds, and listen up to this because you'll need to know, what makes those heart sounds is the first sound, the lub, is the closing of the AV valves shutting lub that's the first sound the closing of these two valves in perfect synchrony it's so perfect synchrony it sounds like one sound lub they both shut the second sound is when the ventricles contract ejecting blood into the arteries and then you get the dub sound so the dub sound is the closing shut not the opening, we wouldn't hear opening, 
but we hear shutting, the shutting close of the semilunar valves, the second set of valves. So blood comes in and fills the atria, the atria contract, the ventricles fill, the AB valves close, lump, the ventricles contract, blood is ejected into the arteries, these two valves close, dub, lump, dub, lump, dub. The function of valves, all of them, is to ensure one-way flow. Again, the function of heart valves is to ensure one-way flow. No backflow allowed because that would be wasted and then that could also be a huge problem. Blood from the right side that has come from the system is oxygen poor that needs to be ejected to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. We don't want any blood going back that would be wasted. All that blood needs to be sent to the lungs. That blood needs to pick up oxygen, drop off CO2, and come back to the left side. The left side needs to be ejecting it to the system to drop off oxygen and pick up CO2. So this has to is a closed system. The two pumps have to be working in synchrony. Lub, dub, lub, dub, lub, dub. The sound that a faulty valve, when a valve doesn't shut all the way, or it shuts but then it weakens and it, uh, and it prolapses, the sound that, a, that blood makes moving past a faulty valve is called a heart murmur. So when you're listening to heart sounds with a stethoscope, you can hear the boom, 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 boom. But if you listen closely, if someone has a heart murmur, you'll hear, and you can Google heart sounds and you can hear that what I'm saying, I'm sort of simulating it, but it really sounds like this. If there's a problem with the AV valves, after the first sound, you'll hear a swishing. It's like a love, instead of like boom, boom, it's like boom, sh, boom, boom, sh, boom, boom, sh, boom, boom, sh. So I know you can make fun of me making these noises, but that's, if you Google heart sounds, it sounds a lot like that. If the valve is faulty as a semilunar valve, if it's one of these, these artery valves, the pulmonary artery valve or the aortic, valve, then the swooshing sound will be after the second sound. It will be boom, boom, sh, boom, boom, sh, boom, boom, sh. But that is absolutely diagnostic of a heart murmur. Now, the thing about heart murmurs is that probably we're all born with slight heart murmurs because our valves are kind of immature and they're whatever. But in most murmurs are benign and can even be outgrown. But some are not. Some are indicating serious disease with the valves. So if you've ever wondered why people place the stethoscope in certain areas when they're listening to not only the lungs, I think a lot of people think they're just listening for the lungs, which they do that too for lung sounds. But they're also, when they're listening for heart sounds, they'll move the stethoscope in a particular way because if they do think they hear a murmur, either after the AV valve sound, the lub, or murmur after the dub, semilunar valves closing, they can place it to figure out is it the right valves or is it the systemic valves on the left side? Is it the pulmonary, you know, this, this pulmonary system circuit or is it the systemic circuit on the left side? Either way, if it's a valve, valve that sounds like it's too much of a, you know, it's a murmur that needs to be checked out. They can actually do echocardiograms where they are really looking in and seeing how that blood is moving, you know, into the heart through the atria, atria to the ventricles, ventricles out through the arteries. And they can actually see these valves opening and closing on an echocardiogram. And they can tell if too much blood is actually escaping backwards. Um, and if there is a problem with that, there can be things that they can do sometimes to treat those. They can even replace valves. So we've gotten in a short period of time, we've gotten quite a bit of anatomy of the heart. We know the heart is not a pump. 
the heart gets two pumps that must be working in perfect synchrony. Otherwise, blood is going to be backing up in a certain area. If, you know, it could be backing up in the lungs, which could then lead to pulmonary edema, meaning the lungs can't work the way they should, or it could be backing up in the system, which means that's going to lead to systemic edema, which again, this puts a burden on the cardiovascular system. But let's, let's stay on track with learning normal uh, anatomy of, of the system of the heart. And we will take a look now. If you think about this, I just moved this picture, but if we take a look at the whole heart, put it back to where it's supposed to be. Um, if we take a look at just a little piece of this heart wall, so if you were in this left side, the systemic heart, you know, systemic system is the left pump. If we were to take a cross section where I've got my mouse here and cut it, we could look at the walls of the heart here. And what you would you would see on this illustration is that the heart itself is in a very tough fibrous sac. The sac is, um, I wish I had you all in lab, but you can look at this on your cadaver and actually see this sac. This sac is actually called the pericardial sac. It's a very tough, tough fibrous layer. And in that sac is the heart, but surrounding the heart is a fluid. And that fluid is called the pericardial fluid. And that fluid is very important. You're making it every day. You're reabsorbing some every day. But the heart is changing size. As you can imagine, as, fluid, as blood comes into the atria, they get bigger, they contract. Then the ventricles have to get bigger and contract. So the heart is actually changing shape and size as blood is moving through it and being pumped. So it means that the sac that it's in, there's fluid to reduce the friction as the heart is changing. So we need pericardial fluid. So fluid fills this sac, this pericardial cavity. There can't be too much fluid because it could be impeding on the heart to be able to fill. And there shouldn't be too little fluid because that could increase the damage to the heart itself too uh, because of the friction that's created. It needs to be just right, the amount of pericardial fluid. So the outermost fibrous layer, this outermost fibrous layer is called the pericardial sac, the pericardium. The fluid is called pericardial fluid. And then the heart wall, like this wall of the heart, when you, if you had a heart in your hand and you were just holding it, this is actually called, the, the they're calling it visceral pericardium, but it's really called the epicardium, epicardium. The muscle is called the myocardium and the lining of the chambers, all the chambers, the lining of the chambers of the heart is called the endocardium. So endocardium is that tissue that lines all the chambers. It kind of looks slick when you look at it. The muscle part of the heart is the myocardium. The outer layer of the heart is the epicardium, epicardium. The sac that the heart is in is the pericardium, and the fluid between the sac and the heart is the pericardial fluid. You really do need to know all of those layers because you will hear about patients who have pericarditis. And if they have pericarditis, you will know that that means, itis always means inflammation, inflammation of that pericardial sac. And probably you know that with inflammation comes increased fluid. So this is putting a burden on the heart when someone has pericarditis. You can also have patients that have epicarditis or myocarditis. And you would know that would mean the muscle wall itself, the muscle itself of the heart is inflamed. Or endocarditis what you all would know was the lining of the chambers of the heart are, in, are infected. There are many different etiologies. Etiology is the study of the cause. That's what that word means. Of these, these situations, uh, they are most often viral. So viruses that can enter into the system. Sometimes they're viruses that were respiratory born or, you know, um, 
enteric viruses, they're, they're, they can actually migrate and cause inflammation of these linings of the heart. They can also be bacterial. So sometimes it's not viral, sometimes it's bacterial that can actually cause these problems. So the etiology needs to be discovered because knowing what's causing it means that we'll know how to treat it effectively. Antibiotics do not help viruses, do they? So we would need to do other types of, other types of treatments depending on what the cause is. So again, these are the different layers of the heart. At this time, you now know um, you now know quite a bit about the anatomy of the heart. You know that it's really two pumps. The heart sits slightly left and the left thoracic cavity, so the sternum is here, it's slightly to the left. Typically, that's the normal presentation. We know the apex of the heart is actually this um, area of the left systemic side that is at, you know, here. We know that um, approximately how big it is. So when you look at the relationship of the diaphragm and the lungs and the heart, this, this sac, the pericardial sac, the front part of it has been cut away here. The sac has been cut away so that you can see the heart inside the sac. That pericardium compartmentalizes the heart so that if there's infection somewhere else, like maybe lung infections or, or whatnot, it doesn't necessarily mean it'll get to the heart. It's just another layer of protection um, for that particular organ. You can, again, see the positioning here, the typical positioning. And you have slides that talk about the pericardium and the heart wall itself um, and these different layers. So I hope that's a little bit of the introduction to the heart. When we think about, again, the chambers, we know what they're called. We know that the vessels that bring blood to the heart are called veins. On the right side, they're the superior and inferior vena cava. And on the left side, there are the pulmonary, left and right pulmonary veins. We know that vessels that carry blood away from the heart are called arteries. On the right side, it's the pulmonary artery. On the left, it's the aorta. We know about the valves. We know about the function of valves. We know um, that they ensure one-way flow. We know there are two sets. There's the AV valves, right and left, and they're the semilunar valves, pulmonary and aorta. And we know they make the heart sounds and um, what that function actually is. When we think about the heart, it is composed of all these tissues, tissues that make up the pericardium, the epicardium, the myocardium, the endocardium, the valves. We know it's composed of these tissues that need blood supply, constant blood supply, because we never want our heart to go without the nutrients it needs to function, the cells that need to function. So the heart itself is nourished by coronary arteries and as those coronary arteries deliver oxygenated um, blood to these tissues to feed the heart wall itself, it's going to be picking up waste and in the form one of CO2 to be returned back to the right side of the heart by coronary arteries. When we look at an anterior view, we can see these coronary arteries that are nourishing the heart. And from a posterior view, you can see those, see them as well. And then the coronary veins that are returning blood uh, in this closed system back to the right side of the heart so that it can be pumped back to the lungs to pick up uh, more oxygen and be brought back to the left side to do it all again. So when someone has bypass surgery, when you hear about someone having a triple bypass or a quadruple bypass, what they are doing is actually not going into the heart chambers. They're not. What they are doing is looking at these coronary arteries. And when they look at these arteries, they are seeing if the arteries are blocked. If it's a triple bypass, it means there were three areas in the coronary arteries, three coronary artery sites that were blocked enough that they had to go in and try to open them up. There are several different ways that they can do that. They can use balloons to try to balloon that area to stretch it out. 
so that where the blockage is, it can be stretched out enough that blood can get past the blockage. They can use a stent where they put a little hollow tube in that area that's blocked so that blood, again, can go through the hollow tube. They can also actually do um, dissections and, and dissect that part out. So there are different ways that they can do um, correct when there are blockages, but when you're talking about bypasses, that's what they're looking at, these coronary arteries that nourish the heart tissues and muscle itself. The heart muscle cannot go without oxygen for any length of time or that those tissues will infarct. Infarct means that there will be a you know, blockage of blood to that site and those tissues die. So infarctions means tissue death due to lack of blood supply, and the heart is very susceptible to that. Um, and when that does happen, those tissues do not regenerate. So when someone is having a heart attack or at risk of that and they're worried about that, they will go in and look at these coronary arteries and see if blood is being impeded because of certain blockages. You'll hear about people who had like a 90% blockage of a coronary artery and you wonder how they weren't having a massive heart attack. Um, hopefully, you know, they're caught early enough that they're not. But that's when you hear about that, that's when um, things are done to help to bypass that area. Again, with ballooning or stents or um, removal of that particular site. So this was, I think, a good introduction to the heart anatomy. There are lots of pictures that you can look at now when you look at this picture and you are seeing um, all of these names. Maybe it won't be so intimidating to you, but I do want you to look at these. Any structures that I have listed, including the vessels, would be structures that you would want to be able to label. Um, and then also understanding how blood comes to the heart, to the chambers, that they're working in synchrony, where the heart sounds come from, exactly what is going on, how, how blood moves through those two chambers and exits the heart by way of arteries. There are other things labeled in here that I haven't mentioned. One of the things that's labeled that I haven't mentioned, I've mentioned all of those, is the fossa ovalis. This fossa, fossa means a depression. This fossa ovalis is kind of hard to see in this picture, but it looks like a little depression here. If you were really seeing this heart not flat as a picture, but as a three-dimensional organ, the right and left atria, they're, they're chambers, they're chambers, but they share a middle wall. It's hard to see that on this picture because it's a coronal section, but this wall here is actually being shared with this left atrium wall. So it's a thin kind of wall, really. So it looks like they're far apart just because of the illustration, but they're not far apart. They're sharing a middle wall there. This depression is part of that middle wall that's being shared with the left. Let me tell you what this is. The fossa ovalis is actually when you're a fetus, when everyone's a fetus, this is actually a hole because blood, when you're a fetus, your blood oxygen's coming from the mother's blood through the placenta to the fetal blood. And that blood is coming to this right, in a fetus, comes to the right atrium and goes directly to the left. You understand that as a fetus, you're in a water environment. Your lungs are not taking in oxygen. So you can't oxygenate your blood because you're in water. <laughs> so the, the whole right ventricle, this is kind of bypassed other than the fact that the lungs are just being uh, getting some blood, but it's bypassed. The oxygenated blood in a fetus is moving straight from the right to the left to go to the left ventricle and then go to the fetus's body. But shortly after birth, shortly after birth, this opening needs to close. And once it's closed, you can still see where the opening was, and it's called the fossa ovalis. If you've ever heard that a baby was born with a hole in their heart, well, technically, we're all born 
with this hole, this opening. But it should be pretty small and it should get even smaller soon. And it should eventually close. And some babies it doesn't. And some neonates it's, it's not really closing. So what ends up happening instead of their own right side sending blood to their lungs there it's it's being wasted and so some is being sent to the lungs but not but some is also just going straight across to the left side before it can get oxygenated by the baby breathing on its own so what happens is the neonate will often be cyanotic which means that they're showing signs that the blood is not oxygenated they will be bluing, they will be turning blue when they cry or they do any kind of movement, or there will be fatigue. There will be signs that the blood is not oxygenated. They will have low oxygen saturations, especially if they're doing anything like crying. So that'll be a first sign that they need to look to see if this phosphovalis has closed or if it's closed enough. Some pediatric surgeons will wait if it's not too too extreme and they will watch it and they will watch to see if it's closing uh, or if the infant is having a, you know trouble sometimes they wait and it closes on their own other times it's serious enough that they will go ahead and go into the heart and close that off with a surgical procedure but this is what the fossa ovalis actually is um, I don't ask really about the chordae tendinae, but these are going to be what helps the valves open and then close, open, close, open, close. Remember, it's the sound of a closing valve that may, gives the heart sounds. So um, most of the rest of this I really have, I've already talked to you about and I've given you, so you have had some, um, I think your, your understanding about, you know, some of this. This is that section that I told you it's an oblique section where if you took a dissection at an angle here just at this particular area you would actually see these um, these valves and again the left one is called a bicusp because there's two cusp here. The right AV tricuspid because there are actually three when you look at it from a dissection that looks like this. I think there's a nut that's really enough for today this first lecture, which is our introduction to the heart anatomy, and now after you've listened to this and you've really thought about the anatomy of the heart and actually this two-pump system, anything that we talked about in this lecture, you can take the quiz that's associated with this. Um, and best wishes on that. Good luck to you.